Hi. So Griff always has these sort of lush gardens mm -hmm. behind him. Tropical. Tropical. Tropical Griff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a good life out here in Ecuador. Yeah. How long are you going to be there? For another couple of months? Uh, just for actually one more week, but then it's Costa Rica. It's not like it changes. Oh, yeah. Week. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one paradise for another. It's a hard life, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. This isn't the first winter I've skipped. We can, that's for sure. <laughs> Ashley's coming in. Amat is coming in. Oh, hi, Ashley. Hey, hey. Hi, Amat. Hi, Ashley. How's it going? Hi, hey, hi Amat. Long time no How are you all today? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> a couple hours, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Raina. How are you? Good. How are you, Amat? Pretty good, pretty good, man. Nice to be here. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, of course. Nicolas Exciting. coming in. Oh, great. Hi, Simone. Hi, everyone. Hi, Simone. Hi. Nice Hi, Simone. Nice to see you. Hi, Sam. Right. This looks like a very nice serious conference room, but I think it's just yeah. a picture, right? I didn't even realize that my background was that. <laughs> <laughs> it's very corporate. Very yeah. corporate. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Nicola. Danny. Hi, Nicola. Oh, he's coming. Oh, cool. He's from Alaska. So this is yeah. probably the only time slot where he can be with us. Monique is coming in. Wow, cool. Wow, fantastic. Lots of people. That's fantastic. Hi, Matt. Whereabouts are you? Yours is a, a real corporate background. Oh, yeah. I'm in a, uh, a co working space by my house. Yeah. It's open now 24 7. Wow. Nice. Cool. Yeah. cool. What time is that on your side? It's uh, 10 p.m. Oh, okay. You yeah, need I'm it. I'm in Dubai. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm all good. I have some coffee. I'm good to go. <laughs> cool. Do you want to start? Do you want to get going? I can let more people in. Sure. They are in the waiting room. Okay. So let me just start by sharing my screen. And um, from there. So. First of all, welcome everyone uh, yeah. to our so what, yeah, strategy meeting. Someone's oh, yes. uh, radio is on or... I think yeah. it's, it's muted now, yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, welcome to the strategy meeting. So first of all, um, I want to just quickly show you some tricks about Miro. If you haven't used Miro before, we're not gonna use any advanced features for this, but really, really simple stuff. Um, so I'm going to share this actually link to you so that you can go there. Um, let me just share the Miro board on the chat. Uh, you can go there if you like. And uh, so to navigate on the Miro board, so this board is created like in a very high definition. <laughs> uh, we were using borrowing some elements, uh, graphic from other boards. Therefore, it becomes like really small, like only three percent, which means that you can zoom in real big. Um, so if it shows up on your, you go to this link, things show up really little. Um, you can zoom in. So the perspective, if you want to check uh, on that and ask me. And the quick trick is the left, your left click on the mouse left is selecting. Um, so selecting a sticky, for example, you use your left click on your mouse. And if you want to navigate around, you use the right click on your mouse and it's just grabbing things and then you can move it around. Um, 
And to add a sticky, which is the key thing, you click on this left menu to add a sticky and you just click on sticky and add it somewhere and start typing like this. Or we actually prepared um, for you once we get to the board of ideation, we prepared a whole bunch of sticky for you. You could just use your left click mouse to click select, grab and move them around, double click to start typing, okay? So that's just very simple Miro board if you're not familiar with Miro. And I think one of the new feature is reactions. So you can actually react to what we're saying, just like in, a, you know, in other meetings and Zoom as well, you can use Zoom as well. Great. So um, let's just do a quick warm up and get to know each other a little bit uh, before we go into our agenda and goals. So um, I'm thinking just simply, um, let's do name and um, your one special skill, okay? So name one special skill, uh, unusual special skill. So I'm talking about things that other people not usually would know about you. Um, don't give me like, I'm good at marketing, that kind of thing. Uh, that's not unusual, okay? So I'll start. Uh, I'm Melody, I'm calling from Berlin today. And my special skill is I know everything about pandas because I've fundraised for pandas for 10 years, went to every panda conference. So I know what do they eat, how much they eat, um, you know, like how do they mate, the, t the period of time where they mate and everything. So, so that's my uh, special power is the panda power. Um, and I'm gonna ask someone else. So you pass, the, you, pass the, you pass it on to someone else. So Claire, name and special skill. Hey everyone. My name's Claire, and I would say my special skill is sorting through a bag of donated clothing super quick and assessing whether it is good for passing on for charity purposes or whether it needs to be recycled. I can get through a bin bag in super fast time and fold it very neatly into boxes. And I'm going to pass it on to Reiner. Hi there, I'm Reiner. Um, I think one of my oldest passions and unusual superpowers is I'm a fairly good rock climber. So I've been in the mountain rescue service youth group back in the days, and uh, that passion is still with me. Uh, and I pass on to Ben. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal yours. Um, I'd say climbing as well is a unique skill that I'm into. So uh, yeah, let's, let's get crazier. Crazier. But anyways, uh, you're, you're off the hook, but the next person, please go. <laughs> we need to talk, Ben, at some point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. I'd love to. Okay, um, pass it on. Yeah, I'll pass it on to Amal. Ah, man. Uh, I'm trying to think about <laughs> a crazy skill of mine. Um, I guess I'm good at playing with children. Like, I don't get bored that easily. Like, uh, I yeah like I'm um, used to always playing with my siblings and cousins and now my um, own daughter so I can play for hours with um, little kids and I and I like don't get bored that easily with that so yeah <laughs> I guess that's my special skill um, let me pass it to uh, Sim hi everyone I'm Sim or Simon um, Special skill, I'd say um, I really have, uh, I've played a lot of backgammon in my life. I'm a real big backgammon fan. Um, and yeah, I'd say that I've got advanced skills in backgammon, but there's partial uh, luck to it. But yeah, I really enjoy playing that. So I'm a big fan if anyone wants to talk about backgammon one day. <laughs> um, and I'm going to pass to um, Monique. Hey everyone, no, I'm Monique. Uh, I, 
I really love eating <laughs> and I'm good at eating. <laughs> I, I really enjoy every bite of my food. <laughs> the craziest food you've eaten. No How's shame that? in that. Yeah, you know, I, I love uh, Persian and Mexican food. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's the, <laughs> I can say that I really love food. You know, I, I really enjoy every bite of it, I can say. I pass it on to Willie. Thanks, Monique. Love your skill. I think if I had to pick one of my unusually unusual skills, it would probably be being ridiculously good looking. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, it's probably, <laughs> probably have to go with being super humble. Double kidding. Okay. My weird skill. Um, this is a weird one. Hopefully you guys don't judge me, but um, I grow really good at um, cannabis. Um, my mom was a, is a PhD botanist, so I grew up around plants. And um, I think the cannabis I grow is even better than the what you can get at the dispensaries here in Colorado. So if anyone ever is in Colorado and wants a sample, happy to share. Okay, pass it on. And I'll pass it to Griff. Nice. Uh, well, I'm excited to sample. Uh, I will, I, uh, I'm actually going to follow my next lead. I was going to say that I used to win piting championship. Uh, I used to win piting contests and uh, with your hands tied behind your back and just like go at it back in college. Uh, so yeah, that's a, definitely a, a special talent. And I'll, I'll throw it over to Lauren. Hey everyone. Um... My, I'm eating right now, so I'll just talk about eating I turn my cameras off. Um, but yeah, special skill. Um, well, my special skill, I, I actually uh, danced like competitively for like 20 something years. So I started with like ballet when I was two years old and then I did tap and I started teaching when I was like 16 and then I was on like competitive hip hop teams, teams into my 20s and like competing in all these competitions in Canada and uh, I did that for a really long time. So I love dancing and um, love teaching dancing in all styles. Um, that's my special skill. I will pass it to Ashley. Hey, everybody. Let's see if we can see my camera. I'm not sure. Yay. Hi. Oh, and I have this weird background, but that's OK. Uh, my name is Ashley. And my special skill, I would have to say, is packing, like backpacks, oh. bags boxes, cars, storage units, houses, everything like tetrising things into a small compartment until you don't think they will fit and they do. That's my skill. Um, and I will pass it to Nicola. All right, if you wanna go really crazy, I'll go at it. Um, so my crazy special skill that can be gift and curse is that I have such an open, Sensors that anywhere I go, I can read the energies. I can, I can read. I can receive information that I don't care to receive. But it helps me to give amazing reflections to people and perspectives that I have no idea that they need to hear. So this is a very special gift, and it's also sometimes very hard to navigate when you can feel so much in the room. And I'm also dancer Lauren. Let's dance someday. Okay. Uh, who didn't go? Uh, Danny or Danny. Danny. Oh, me? Uh, yeah, I, I'm yeah. gonna. I know me. Okay, you go. Either, <laughs> either one. <laughs> go, Daniel. <laughs> okay, I'll turn on my video for just a moment, but I'm, I'm lounging here for a moment. Um, I'm Danny. Um, let's see. I'm gonna jump from Ashley's packing skill and my special skill is actually unpacking and creating space and energy out of objects. So my special skill is I can pick up a lot of objects, drape tapestries, place colors and textures in a way that creates a feeling that allows everyone to be in that same energetic space and tap into collective wisdom. So my special skill is space creation and energy movement by placing objects and drawing your eye through them. And I'll pass it back over to Dan. Thank you. Uh, let me turn on my camera. Um, well, my name is Dan. Uh, most of you already uh, know me, mostly working with uh, builders. I also really love the idea of connecting Web 2.0 
uh, with Give It and bringing more people in and make it easier for them, maybe like frictionless. Um, a special skill. I, I've been told that I am like San Francisco, I see, so like the Dr. Doolittle, because you know, dogs and cats, they, and, and animals in general, kind of like they just like uh, come to me and you know, are super friendly. <laughs> And I love petting animals, so I mean that that's definitely uh, one. No. Great. And okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to pass it, but I don't know if uh, maybe I mean all have gone or. Okay. I came a bit late. Hey everyone, sorry. There's a plane flying overhead. Small engine plane. I can pack things amazingly, but I think a special skill I have is I'm incredibly grounded in water. I can really intuitive things through water. I can't explain it. Um, which makes me an excellent swimmer, though I swim like a manatee because I'm pretty chill in the water. Great. Yay. So I hope you have now know a little bit more about each other, which I, I have, which, you know, it's great to work with you guys. <laughs> and uh, so let's, uh, I just reposted the uh, Myroboard link if you haven't gotten it and you come in late. Um, so let's go over the goals uh, first. So with this meeting, we're going to identify some overlaps and differences in the theories of change in the team for GIVIS as a whole, not just for the Connect Work Group. Uh, and second, the Connect Work Group, you know, through the session wants to know where to focus our work. So hopefully this brings focus to our work group and hopefully others as well. And third is that we know after this, how, you know, if we want to continue with more sessions, uh, explore, um, you know, more in deep dive in any of the elements that we're going to talk about today. Um, so the agenda today, obviously, first, we welcome a warm up and hopefully you all warmed up. Um, and second, we go through this goals and um, Claire's going to talk a little bit about our uh, working group again. And um, Reiner is going to present our current narratives and assumptions based on the Giveth documentations and uh, obviously our own perception. And then we're gonna do ideation, discussions, breakout discussions, and group reflections. And hopefully we'll be uh, checking out in, you know, um, in two hours. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have two hours. So it's kind of a little bit of a long time. So there will be a break in between ideation discussion, I think. Um, so that's pretty much today uh, what we're gonna do. So Claire, do you want to start with uh, introducing our group again to everyone? Yeah, sure. Hi everyone. The Connect Working Group aims to build a sort of communications and knowledge bridge um, and is proposing six key areas where the Connect Work Group can add value to give us. So the first one of these is around the curation of projects. There's been a lot of discussion in the forum about how we verify projects and what projects to bring on board. And um, while we move to a more decentralized model for verifying projects, it's about what system do we build in, if any, to help verify and curate these projects. The second area is around engagement. So the idea is that we form some kind of user-centered user strategy to increase engagement within the Giveth community, both on the giveth.io and through the Discord server, and um, look at how we do this through donor and project research. The next area is around stakeholders. Um, this is with particular reference to projects and donors and how we increase and get the engagement of donors and projects and incorporate their voice into, um, into their communication. The third one, sorry, the fourth one or whatever one, <laughs> the next one is around outreach. And this is largely around what um, Melody has already started to do um, where we are connecting give us to the general public goods sector through thought leadership, conferences and general outreach, um, um, providing more presence on traditional social media, perhaps through Facebook, perhaps LinkedIn, 
And the next area is around sort of support for fundraisers, the logistics around sort of onboarding, improving that experience um, to try and raise the standard maybe of project pages through the creation of best practice reference resources, um, help projects to be able to off ramp their funds or use their funds in some way, and generally try and help improve the smooth running of the project profile pages. And the final one we've added is to um, make sure that Giveth does not reproduce some of the problematic patterns within the traditional nonprofit sector. Um, Melody and Rhino will both contest that there are um, some problem areas in there. And it's about how do we improve what Giveth has to offer over the traditional nonprofit sector. Right. And then pass that back to you, Melody. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that, Melody or Reina. I think you missed one, which is accessibility. It's <laughs> less of a goal, but more of a focus that goes throughout all of these um, so that we want to make sure that accessibility is a priority and focus on uh, non-technical and non-Web3, uh, uh, non-Web3 native users and how give this really communicate with every stakeholder. Um, oh, thanks, good spot. I didn't yeah. realize I'd missed that one out and it's quite an important one too. Yeah, so I'm gonna pass on to Reiner now uh, to our next step. Hi there, thanks again for being here. So uh, we're gonna jump into what we call a theory of change now for like 10 to 15 minutes or so. So what do we mean by theory of change? Um, so everyone who works at Giveth, all of you have in the back of your mind sort of a, a, a set of ideas and assumptions about what kind of effect it has that you do and how that in turn leads to something else that then leads to something else and then that in turn solves the, the problem that Giveth wants to solve or fulfills the mission of, of Giveth, right? Everyone has this sort of web or model, mental model in your head, how things actually connect and what leads to what. And what we'd love to do just as an experiment is to see what happens if you make that explicit and actually write it down, you know, to actually spell it out. What, what's, what's your mental model of what, what, what Giveth is actually trying to do? And that can be very useful in my experience because when you make it explicit and actually write it down, it turns out that uh, you often see that it actually differs. Our mental models differ the way in which we conceptualize what Giveth wants to do. And so what we'd like to offer is our version, like Melody's, Claire's, and my version of how we understand right now what Giveth is actually doing and to compare it with your impressions and to see where there's overlap and where there's difference and where we can maybe... Um, help each other to get on the same page or clarify stuff that might be unclear, not only between Melody, Claire and, and, and me, or, or between the, the, the Connect group and the rest of the team, but maybe between some of you too. So it's fairly easy to make this very complicated and, uh, and analytic and scientific if you want to. Um, we keep it very simple. We have a very simple model on the right side of the mirror board. And um, you, wanna, you might wanna connect or concentrate on the on the six steps with these white circles and some symbols in there just to have a walk through the categories. So we think of the theory of change in six steps. The first one is you actually try to pin down what's the problem that you're trying to solve? What's the vision that you have? You know, what, what should the world look like once you've actually solved the problem? What's the sort of utopia, the ideal state? And the mission means what's our role in getting there, you know, to, to get the on the path to solving that problem. Then the second step is the input, which means which resources do we have? Well, you know, what, what kinds of resources do we have at our disposal to, to work on this? The third step is stakeholders. Who are actually the groups and communities that we want to engage with in our work with Giveth or through Giveth? Uh, the fourth step is what do we actually do? What are the kinds of things that we offer? What are the activities, or, you know, in more traditional settings, you would say, what are the products or the services that you offer to these specific shareholders, uh, stakeholders? Then fifth step is output. So what are the direct results? What, 
results from these activities? What becomes better sort of immediately or short term or very concretely? And then uh, last step, outcome slash impact. The difference between outcome and impact is very sort of academic. We can sort of put it in one category here, which is what are the long term changes in society or in a specific group that that uh, are being triggered or are being being caused through your work? which then ideally should connect back to your problem definition, uh, the thing that you started with in the first place that you wanted to solve. And um, I will use this model to tell, let's say a story, a narrative for around 10 minutes or so. And it's, it's a, again, it's the, it's the change story or the theory of change that uh, we, the three of us, so the, the, the connect group has, of giveth right now. And this, the story is not perfect, you know? In fact, it should not be perfect. It just reflects how we understand it. And we really don't do this because we find this sort of just academically interesting, but because it really, really helps us as a connect group to understand where exactly giveth wants to focus on, at what point, uh, with what group of projects, for example, and for what reason, you know? What's the underlying assumption why we need to talk to that particular group and what we think gets better in the world by working with specifically that group. So please bear with me for around 10 minutes or so. Um, along the way, you will agree with some of the things that I say, and you will disagree with some of the things. You will have positive tensions with what I'm saying and negative tensions with what I'm saying. So please write it down. Um, keep it to yourself for now. Write down your comments and reactions. We have enough time later to discuss it and see where things overlap and where actually we have different views on, on how this should go. Okay, so here we go. Um, we can start in the first sort of quadrant or the first uh, little cell here under problem, vision, mission. So I, um, the, the problem as I understood it, uh, and I'm fairly new to give it is public goods are underfunded and depend on sacrifice, begging and the self-exploitation of individuals. Right, that's the basic problem that, that Give is trying to solve. It's an instant of the Moloch problem, if you want to be very abstract about it. Then what's the vision? Um, there are some instances where Giveth actually talks about this very clearly. For example, in the Giveth talks, it says, giving is effortless and people all around the world are rewarded for creating positive change. So that's what the world should look like if we succeed in what we're doing with Giveth. Then what's the mission? What's the role of Giveth in getting there? I have, I have found two instances where, or two formulations of that. One is in the docs and it says, giveth builds a culture of giving that rewards and empowers those who give uh, to projects, to society, and to the world. That's in the docs. And then on the, on the slide deck uh, that's called helping giveth grow, there's another formulation which says, uh, giveth is supporting and rewarding the funding of public goods by creating open, transparent, and free um, access to the revolutionary funding opportunities available within the Ethereum ecosystem. So these are a couple of formulations around Giveth's mission. You see they're already not completely similar. So they have different aspects. Transparency, for example, shows up in one formulation, doesn't show up in another one. So there's a bit of fuzziness here, uh, but that's where we start right now. So if you go to the second cell around what resources does Giveth have, it has a group of very talented contributors. You know, all of you, the, the, the more technical people, the programming people, but everyone in the contributor team, uh, incredible network in the crypto space, uh, very well networked through Griff and other individuals here that have been in the scene for many, many years. Sufficient financing, you know, there's, there are funds enough to pay people, which is very important. Lots of ideas for the roadmap. You know, the give economy ideas are like, you know, endless. It's fantastic. So there's lots of creativity there. Um, there is a reliable software base. You know, there's a DAP that works very well. There is a platform that works very well. So that's already there. And there is a unique rewarding mechanism enabled by tokenomics. You know, the give back, give stream. So that's something that is already created as a, as a kind of asset. So which groups and community does Giveth want to engage with? with these resources or with these, um, with these uh, sort of assets and inputs. Um, we grouped it into four different groups of stakeholders. I think it's a, it's a kind of framework that I heard a couple of times from Griff. So we have the projects, common good projects. We have the donors, 
we have the builders uh, and we have the token holders. And for the purposes of this discussion here, we'd love to concentrate on the first two for now. So talking mainly about the projects and the donors because they are most relevant for the work of the connect group. This is also why I put a red circle around it because that's, a, that's one area where we are particularly interested in, in getting input from you. So now one interesting question is common good projects. You know, there's a whole universe out there of common good projects. So which ones exactly are we interested in targeting? And what we see, it's a hypothesis, right? We don't know if that's true, but what we see right now is uh, as a hypothesis, it seems that Giveth wants to work in two phases. There's a phase one and there's a phase two. And for phase one, it seems that Giveth would like to concentrate on right now immediately on projects that are that are first of all, they're not aimed at private gain, right? So it's, there is not a very sort of sophisticated quality assurance or screening mechanism that makes sure that there's a certain impact threshold or something like that. There's a, there's a rough check about, okay, this is not for private gain. This is obviously, there's a public good, you know, intention here involved. So that's one, one criterion. The other one is uh, projects that do not need a lot of handholding. So, so that they can benefit from the platform right away. It seems that right now there is a focus on projects that don't that are not completely ignorant around crypto. Um, and then a third criterion seems to, to us to be projects that potentially bring in more donors, right? That help us to build the other side of the platform. Um, I'll get into phase two later, but just for now, let's let's follow that. So we're not, and that's the red sticker here. It seems we're not uh, targeting right now with a specific focus, especially impactful or transform transformative or especially innovative or disruptive projects. That's not the filter through which we look at the sort of universe of projects out there. It's more the other three that I mentioned. So what do we do with these projects? We switch to the, to the activities cell. We offer a platform where projects can raise funds in crypto with zero added fees. And we offer educational material on how to handle crypto donations, like the off-ramping resource and these kinds of things. So jumping to the next cell, what do we think is going to be the output of this kind of activity? So we assume that if we do all that, the projects will receive more donations than they did before, right? That is an extra, an extra resource channel for them. We also assume that projects will learn more about crypto through their engagement there. And we also assume that more donors come to the platform if we pick the right kinds of projects and get them on the platform. And that in turn for us, and now we are in the last cell, outcome impact, what the overall effect that we'd like to see or that we assume will happen is that as a result of these activities and outputs, more projects out there find it attractive to receive donations in crypto. So there's an overall mindset shift around projects finding crypto as a, as a resource or a funding source much more important uh, and relevant than before. And we also assume that more projects on the platform become interested in more deeply exploring tokenomics. You know, what, what else is there that we could do just beyond channeling some other kind of resource uh, in the old fashioned way to our coffers, right? Or to our funding. And that's where, where phase two kicks in. You see the, the blue uh, arrow leading backwards to cell number three or to the stakeholder cell, to phase two. So it seems once we have enough of these projects and we have a sort of critical mass of projects on the platform, we wanna focus more on offering support to those projects that are, uh, where we want to help them build DAOs and microeconomies. And that's why the criterion for picking um, projects for this phase two will, will be more focused on projects that are easily DAOable. I call it DAOable, you know, in the sense of they were small, they're not the Red Cross, right? It's very difficult to convert the Red Cross into a DAO or create a microeconomy for the Red Cross. So we'd be more interested for this phase two in smaller, more crypto-ready, more flexible, more DAOable projects. And these we would support in building DAOs and microeconomies and bonding curves for themselves. And that in turn, um, now we're in the outputs uh, cell already, leads to more DAOs and microeconomies emerging out there. 
which in turn leads to, that's the last cell now, uh, the fact that public goods projects are funded in a more sustainable way. You know, that would be part of the revolution to say, we really escape this old logic of, I have to beg uh, rich people for money or rich donors for money. Uh, with bonding curves and microeconomies, you have a very different, a much more sustainable way of funding projects. And through that also, the self-exploitation in public goods projects diminish. And all of that essentially leads to, and that's the last big uh, sort of post-it at, at, at the end is, more public goods are being provided. Right? That's the whole point of what we're doing here. We want to increase the public goods that are being produced out there. Which then, and that's the, the really big blue arrow leads back to the problem statement. That's what, that was why we are in this game in the first place. Now, if we look at the donor side of it, uh, if we go back to the stakeholder overview um, and look at the donor sort of row. So we want to target donors. We want to approach donors, engage with donors. Which ones exactly? It seems to us at this point that Giveth is especially interested in individual and institutional donors and investors that are already, that already know how to handle crypto. It seems that there is not a lot of interest right now to go into the very general, very you know, conventional philanthropic, philanthropic sector, and try to convince them with a lot of effort to go into the crypto for, space in the first place. So we wanna pick those that are already sort of on the fence of becoming more active there. What do we offer to these donors? We offer verification of projects. Uh, we offer give backs and the gift stream. And in the future, we offer a powerful curation mechanism through gift power. So that ideally it's more easily visible for a funder, for a donor, which projects are better or, or the right projects for them. So now we're in the output uh, category. What is the immediate effect that we want to see? Donors are rewarded for giving. That's a new one, right? Typically you are rewarded in a sense by the state, you know, through tax benefits, but here we have a much more open Sort of concept because you don't need to be a charity in order for a donor to, to be rewarded for uh, for support. What we also offer or what we also think will happen is individual donors are connected directly to projects so they don't have to go through you know big fundraising institutions they can connect directly with the projects that are interested. And then another thing that we hope happens is that donations through the verification mechanisms that we offer and through gift power Donations are channeled to the right or the best projects. And that's a question to be discussed, to be honest, what that actually means, right? So if we think about gift power, if gift power works perfectly, what kinds of projects actually bubble to the top of the ranking or to the top of what people see uh, at top of the curation or the, the result of the curation? What do we think is going to change in society as a result of that? That's now the last. Uh, sort of column, donors find it more attractive to give. That's what we want to see, all right? We want to see that donors who probably wouldn't have given any funds to particular projects now find it attractive because they are rewarded even though the you know, tax status is not very clear or it's difficult because it's cross-border or all the typical problems that you have or the typical friction that you have with you know, conventional donations. And we also want to see that more donors turn towards crypto, um, which in turn, again, should lead to more public goods are being provided, which leads us back again to where we started. That's the problem we wanted to solve. So that's the story as we see it today, uh, at least for newcomers like uh, Melody and, and Claire and me when we come in. So we'd love to give you a bit of time to reflect now on your sort of gut feeling about what you heard when you listened to the story. And with that, I'll hand over to Melody. Great. Um, yeah, so the story that Reiner just told is kind of like an example of our thinking. So first of all, any questions? Let's not go into a discussion, but question about the model. No? Um, so what we're going to ask you to do next is to think individually um, and you know, what, what you think and what you perceive, what you assume that Giveth model is. 
Um, so this is what like what we see uh, as an example for you. And uh, so maybe we'll use 10 minutes uh, to we'll set the timer at 10 minutes just for individual heads down time. We're not gonna discuss yet because we want you to have an opportunity to think for yourself. And if you can go down to the, uh, the columns below, uh, what do you like about the narrative above? And what do you disagree with the vision above and why? Um, use this time to put down your thoughts and um, with stickies. If you can stick to one color, then it will be easier for you to, to make this happen, but it's okay. If you don't stick, like grab any kind of sticky, you can just um, start writing your thoughts down. Um, so when we can actually capture these data points from you and um, yeah, and then we can move on with discussion afterwards. So I'm gonna set the timer now to 10 minutes. Uh, right, Reiner, do we say 10 minutes for this one? Yeah, I think that's good. Okay. So you have time to think through. Do we want music? <laughs> if you have some. Uh, there's music. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> smooth groove, up tempo funk, sunshine jam, calm flow. Any suggestions? Sunshine jam. Sunshine feel, free to, jam. feel free to switch off your cameras if you can concentrate yeah. better. Exactly. Feel free to concentrate. With yourself. Okay. So the timer starts now. <clears throat> If you think the music is distracting, let me know and I'll turn it off. Has someone changed my grid?
Just want to remind you to start moving on to the other columns and uh, don't overthink. Um, time is running out, but I'm gonna just add five minutes so that we can kind of finish the whole process. Yeah, and try to really use the columns. 
No? Uh, so there might be a disagreement or agreement from, from you, especially around the stakeholders, or around the outputs, and try to position sort of the stickies where they where they belong, where the sort of best match is for your agreement or disagreement. And I think we're just supposed to add to the bottom, right? I feel like things at the top are changing, which is changing the way that my opinions are being added. But um, I think that the bottom two rows are the place that we're supposed to add feedback, right? Yeah, yes. that's just, yeah. Just leave the top as it is, if possible. Yeah, just yeah, the there's new stuff in there, like region farms and other oh, stuff. Oh yeah, okay. That I like, but, uh, <laughs> but I like it. I mean, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I would have put that too, but. <laughs> Yeah, you would uh, probably add to the bottom row if you don't see anything that is in the hypothesis that you want to add on. So the first row is really like, I like, and the second row is like a wish or like something that we, we don't see. Sorry, the second and the third row. So don't add to the first row. Only add to the second and the third. Thanks. <laughs> and move on to the other columns uh, if you can now. And I think we're biased uh, towards disagreement. So if you disagree, please put your disagreement out there.
You have under 30 seconds. We are at time. Um, I've got to hop off too, though. But this is a really awesome um, exercise, and I look forward to watching the recording. Sorry, I can't hang for the the full thing. No problem. Thank yeah. You yeah. Great. Thanks. Bye, Willie. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so this is why we want to uh, we want to write like write your ideas down so we capture these data points and uh, and when we have like time to actually look through them group them we'll be able to present it to other community members but the next step though Reiner uh, we're gonna do discussions right so we'd love to start the discussion by um, giving you a few minutes in breakout rooms so that you have groups of two where you can start you know um, having conversations about what you wrote and where you wrote it so that you can sort of warm up to a, a larger discussion that we're going to have after a bit of a break. So we'll give you say like eight minutes or so in breakout groups and then you can come back then we have a couple of minutes of, uh, of a break and then we can go into a larger discussion uh, with a bit more uh, refreshed. Yeah? Okay so I'll see you in groups of two and uh, I'll let you know once you pass sort of half of the time so that you have a good good way of um, spending your time. Okay, see you. Monique, are you there? Can you hear me? Monique? I, I assigned Monique to your I assigned Monique to your group, but I think he he's not online properly. Um, is it okay for you if I put you in a group of two other people? Yeah, sure. Oh no, Monique is here now. Okay. So I'll leave the room. Sorry, sorry.
Ah. There's always not enough time. <laughs> Welcome back. No, it's always a shock. Yeah. <laughs> Mid sentence. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, Melody. Should we do a five minute break? Yeah. Let's uh, yeah. Let's do a break, and then we'll um, you know we'll come back. Why do awesome. I come back? Yeah. Twelve. Uh, at what time? At sixteen past the hour. Okay. Sixteen. Feel past free to the get hour. something to drink. Uh, yeah. Get up. Remember that you have a body. <laughs> See you in five minutes. Yeah. You guys. Thanks, guys.
Okay, welcome back. So, um, it would be tempting to discuss all of this now. It's enormous, right? Uh, I think it shows one thing, which is that there's quite a bit of diversity in, uh, you know, on all levels. Um, there are quite a few different directions on, you know, both on the vision and mission level, but also down to what do we want to do? Also down to what, what are our assumptions, what is going to happen once we do this, this, and this. So um, what we would be most grateful for, I think, in the Connect group would be to start the discussion with the things that we circled. There are three red circles um, around interesting clusters of comments or interesting comments that are specifically relevant to the work of the Connect group. And we can, we can use these to start the discussion and then sort of open it up later on so that we can hear more perspectives that maybe uh, refer to different or other parts of the theory of change. Um, one thing that I found very interesting is the one uh, where we have the three different post-its here, the three stickies. Um, so I'll read them once again. Um, on the left, it says, we're actually a platform for anyone to raise funds, public good or not. Emphasis should be on public good, but we still want to make it easy and accessible for people to raise funds for their sick kids treatment. So that's a very inclusive understanding of who we should target. Basically everyone, right? Um, not even public good related. And then on the other side, we have the, the pink sticky note, which is on the other end of the spectrum, someone who says it would be cool if we could support disruptive impact projects with high potential for mega impact. That's a very exclusive view on the stakeholder group projects, right? So a very small subset, only the, the most disruptive, most mega impact projects. And then there is something in between. Um, I think projects need to be split into nonprofits, fundraising projects, wider long-term initiatives, which all have very different goals and incentives. Also, we need to think in awareness stages of who to target for donors and projects. So this is more a plea for sort of more segmenting the different kinds of projects that are in Giveth and maybe treating them differently. And I think it's exactly this question that is really relevant for, for the Connect Group because quite a few people in the connect group have really good networks in the sort of more conventional nonprofit uh, public good philanthropy space. But it's really important to know who specifically should we target, right? Is give it a more exclusive platform and we should reach out to the networks that have very, you know, a, a, a very exclusive uh, set of very highly validated high impact projects or with, would it be reaching out to a much more sort of participatory egalitarian network that uh, basically includes everyone. And I'd love to start with that and maybe hear a little, you know, the different perspectives that are in the group around, you know, what's the ideal project to get on board for Give right now from your point of view? What should we focus on in the Connect group? I think that the, I mean, we want projects that are bringing more donors onto the platform and we want like public goods projects and also projects that like one day could potentially become DAOs. So it's like people who aren't like totally allergic to, to tech, um, who are like willing to learn and see value in the crypto space. Um, and then like that are also providing public. Good. I think the emphasis should be on public good. This is actually the blue comment is my comment. I think we should have the platform be totally open to anyone raising funds for like whatever that they want. Um, but like we have the verif verification system. It's like projects that are raising funds for their sick kids don't get verified. And, but they can be there on the platform and they can be listed and people can see them. And like, that's cool. Um, but I don't think it's like our main focus group and like for the connect working group, we should focus on like projects that are providing public good who are gonna bring more donors onto the platform and kind of like increase widespread use of giveth. And um, that like, hopefully one day could um, be become like use this tech to, to become a DAO, et cetera. So it's like not all these nonprofit projects are really crypto savvy yet, but I think like people, projects that are, that see the value in getting in the Web3 and crypto space is, is um, the people we want because they fit into the long-term vision. And, and can I just drive off of that since the mic is open? I, I, I really think that we need to be looking for the biggest wins uh, if you have a connection with a philanthropist, you know, that wants to donate, 
uh, and to a specific cause, then that's great. Let's onboard that cause and let's onboard that philanthropist. Uh, I think that's all fine uh, as as long as they as long as it, it's a big win, you know. Uh, the big wins opportunities that we have are what we should maximize. You know, if you you can donate to a project that is not affiliated to with huh. where you pay taxes and receive a big benefit using Give It, if that satisfies the need for someone and they're willing to donate hundreds of thousands of dollars then it's worth our time to onboard them to crypto and help them figure it out. Um, and it's worth our time to onboard that project. But the worst thing is that we're like, hey, there's this really impactful project that's doing amazing things. Let's spend a lot of time and resources onboarding them to the platform. And then they, and also have them spend time and then have them not get any donations. That is the most tragic thing that could ever happen. And we want to avoid that at all costs. We don't want to, we we should be onboarding projects. It's a fundraising platform. We should be onboarding projects that have donors that, that will get funded, you know? And the best way to do that is to ask the donors, in my opinion, what projects they want and how much they want to donate to them and then make the effort from that direction. So your strategy would be, we don't reach out directly to projects that much. We reach out to donors. The donors recommend who they would like to fund and then we onboard these projects. That, that's what I would suggest. And then the donors have, they say, yeah, you know what? If you could onboard the Red Cross, I would donate $3,000 to them. Oh, okay. Makes talking to the Red Cross a lot easier. You know, uh, why should they accept crypto? Because there's this dude with crypto who has three grand and wants to give it to them, you know? Mm -hmm. What are other perspectives on that question in the group? Um, I just want to say that maybe this really relates to the problem we're solving for me like is is our problem that we're solving is to uh, create the the most public goods and the most social impact or are we trying to create systemic change you know like to change people's mind behaviors towards more economy because different if these two go the goals are different then you know, the approaches and people that we want to target would be different. Other perspectives? I agree with the approach of donors, approaching donors, because it would be a tragedy if we've got a lot of projects on board with no donors. Um, but then how do we secure getting the projects? and maybe it's not going to be possible at this stage but if we could do a dual approach of having some communications or communications plan for it reaching donors and whether that happens on our uh, select influencers that we know have a large crypto base that they can spread the message just bring awareness to what uh, give us does um, and then in the same, well, with using different, a different plan and different uh, platforms, do the same for projects. We would be able to tick both of those, but it comes down to resources. But I do personally think that that's going to be the only way that we would be able to, to achieve that objective and do it kind of simultaneously, whether it's realistic or not. I know it's difficult to not prioritize either one, but I think that it's a chicken egg situation. It's both got to grow together. Mm -hmm. Who else would like to say something? Dan? I want to, I want to jump into that too. Um, I, I think I like a kind of like this uh, black sticker perspective. And I think one of, one of the things that we have as, as a DAO you know, whereas business usually need to narrow down the scope a lot. Um, maybe as a DAO, you do need to narrow down things too. Um, but but maybe uh, you, you can narrow down different scopes. Um, so I, I think that whereas it, it, it is, I agree with Simone and I, I agree with um, Griff, that it, it, it's, it is a tragedy if, you know, there, there are projects coming in and not being able to, to raise funds. And we do need to bring on donators to the, uh, donors to the platform. Um, I, I, I also think that as like Lawrence 
uh, sticker says, you know, we want to keep it open for anyone to be able to, to raise capital. And I think in this sense, um, from what I know, I don't know the exact numbers, but I almost all the crowdfunding platforms uh, bring, uh, provide a very few, very few of uh, the traffic to their projects. I mean, most projects have to bring their own donors and have to make their own marketing. Um, and this is, as far as I know, the business standard, and this is how, how it works. So if we manage to bring many other donors and we have the matching pool and we have all these things and we're bringing even more value and that's super awesome. And I think we definitely should focus a little bit on that. Um, but just not take apart that anyone should be able to, 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 to feel included, right? In, in uh, to be able to raise their own funds. Um, I mean, but we, we don't have to promise that anyone will from, you know, and, and we don't have to, we, we, we're not responsible for, for projects to, to get donations and, and we will try to bring more donors and, and they will find their own projects. And I think it's, it's amazing what we are having now with the spaces for uh, the makers in Twitter. And I think that we should have more things where people can get engaged and get to know the projects. I donated to projects that I met on the, on the, on, on Twitter spaces, uh -huh. um, because, you know, it's, it's different than, than trying to browse for a project when you have a, a, a different interaction. So I don't know, that's, that's just my perspective. Thank you. Can I be a bit provocative? So if we go down that path and say we approach, we hear from a donor who'd like to give a lot of money to a specific project and we go through that donor and then onboard the project onto the platform for essentially one big transaction that is supposed to happen anyway, right? So why wouldn't we send the project to the giving block and say, you know, you make yourself crypto ready, then you can receive that big transaction. I mean, the only st strong argument in favor of giveth would be the give back reward, right? But not the platform itself, because what the project is interested in that particular moment is this one big transaction. And, and also that the- I'm sorry. Oh my God. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, man. Sorry. sorry. Uh, I think you got the, it. The other thing is that uh, with the giving block, you can only accept main net donations uh, of very few tokens. So there's a lot more um, accessibility. Sorry, can you say that again? The, the, you can't. You can't. Uh, you you can't accept XDAI or you know Gitcoin GTC. You know yeah. you can only accept the tokens that Gemini allows. Yeah, the which... giving block is limited, um, but they still raise quite a lot though. And one one point that I want to tag on to Dan is that. Um, as a professional fundraiser, I know that any giving platform is not that you sign up and you get money. You have to, you as a project, you have to be responsible for doing a campaign around this uh, crowdfunding initiative. And I think, you know, it's, it makes sense if we want to focus more on helping them to know that they need to fundraise, they need to pull their own weight in bringing donor in um yeah like like what dan said is right you know it's any it's not just crypto any any uh, regular money uh, go fund me or whatever if you don't do anything nobody's gonna give to you either um that's right but i think in this particular situation it's oh i see my camera's not on that's right but in this particular situation it's a little bit more challenging for a project to go out and start asking for crypto donations. So maybe there needs to be a little bit of support and education for the projects to let them know where to go to to find these crypto donors, because they're not going to be in their existing community. They're not going to be in the places that they are used to, to fundraising. So they either have to have as the conversation has been going, they either have to have that existing crypto network and knowledge already. Or I think 
give us needs to continue doing more of the meet the maker kind of events so that donors can come on board and they can get to know the projects and see the faces of them because that's really helpful. Um, I have something else to add as well. So um, I think also there are lots of projects that have a really big pain around raising donations because of um, restrictions in um, like where they're based, which could be government um, like restrictions or based on the country that they're in. Um, and like a lot of projects that I know, like they can't raise money through like a Kickstarter. I mean, because like in the country, like they just can't do it. Like they don't have like a PayPal account and they can't do it. So mm. I think like there is a case to find projects that have like a real pain and they can't raise money any other way. It's interesting. We're getting down to a set of criteria, right? It seems that either one of the two sides, either the donor or the project already has a foot in the door in terms of crypto engagement, right? If, if none of the two has any sort of crypto exposure, it's probably too much handholding. So we shouldn't do it. And then there's this, this other case that you're describing, right, where there's where it's legally, technically, politically not possible to do it in fiat, right? Okay, you raised your hand. Yeah, in the breakout room, I was telling uh, Griff that when I came across Gibbeth a little bit like Kotabi, I think it was, um, it was through the engagement is how I actually felt the desire to give back, uh, to participate on the platform. And I saw Giveth more as like, because I come from the Web3 world, a, a sort of neutral uh, shared brand by all those projects listed on the platform. Um, and what I keep hearing within this idea of bringing in major donors like the Red Cross is um, we're forgetting that they already have an audience. It's just how and who they share that audience with isn't always accessible. And so I think one of the assets of Giveth is the potential to develop shared um, awareness around audiences that are interested in giving back. That means both from individual donors who give, but also from projects that show up, because then it becomes like this big shared IP that everyone gets a benefit from, from the open web. Thank you. Any other perspectives on that? Okay, I'd like to uh, switch to a related point maybe, which is a bit further bottom right, which has probably been sort of solved already or been discussed already. So how do we, how do we sort of focus our resources or if we have a choice of spending one more hour on approaching projects or one more hour on approaching donors, which one should we pick, right? What should we decide? And I hear from the discussion now that donors are probably the more efficient way to get what we want to get. Yeah, and I, and I also think that we have a lot of projects adding their projects onto the platform and a lot of projects trying to get verified, um, but not a ton of donations happening through the platform, even though we have the give backs program. So I think, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's like, there's already great projects and so maybe even supporting the projects that we have in their, um, you know, their advertising to donors or like how they can reach their donors better. Maybe that would help bring more donors and also be helping the project simultaneously. And it's maybe a direction that can be taken with Connect. Yeah, okay. Whilst also spreading awareness of Giveth. And I kind of see it like, we give us has crypto at its core so the donors bring the crypto therefore it makes sense that a lot of the energy should be channeled around bringing in more donors and understanding what sort of projects they would like to give to yeah i agree with that and i really like the points on how we can encourage both projects and donors to share how we can enable them to recommend. So if there's donors and they can easily recommend projects that they're interested in in their area, this is a point that Melody and I were chatting about in our breakout room. And just that way, try and spread the, the message of, you know, more organically, but then other ways that we would be able to do it with higher impact 
uh, I feel would be approaching the mediators. Another point that Melody and I chatted about before. Um, the charity organizations that have connections with many charities. Uh, sorry, charities. It's uh, my jargon's got to change. Um, the the uh, for good projects. Um, maybe there's some mediators that could connect us, or um, uh, donors by by connecting with people that are crypto that have crypto bases that we would be able to spread the message to, um, and that way we get people that are genuinely interested in joining the movement and spreading it that way. Yeah, I can't help thinking, not help thinking, but definitely know that you know larger charities do have a huge base of donors and at least certain percentage of them are crypto friendly and that's how they get donors onto the giving block because you get um you know like you you already have a major giving database of say 500 to a thousand and usually like a charity would have like over 3,000, 3,000, 10,000 records of donors. You know, they come with a huge amount of donors, um, some of the projects. So that's kind of going for the projects, you know, like if projects are interested, why not engage them? So they can bring a huge amount of donors to this platform because, you know, recognizing there's uniqueness and values that they can offer. I see people raising hands. Uh, I think Rainer is muted, but sorry, yeah, I, can go I, ahead. I just said oh. there are hands up from Monique and then I assume that, okay, that's your old hand, right? So Monique, go ahead. Uh, I think we uh, have to bring donors uh, through the projects. So, uh, you know, it's not just about bringing donors to the platform, but donors come and say, hey, you know, let, let's use the project, you know, it's, it's not working, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, as uh, Dan said, uh, usually projects uh, advertise or do marketing for their projects. Uh, for, uh, and uh, we may help them to bring uh, donors. Uh, I do know that, uh, you know, brand is matter. Uh, so we have to do branding for awareness for the donors that, hey, this is platform is a good thing. You know, we, we have give backs, we have blah, 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 but you know, uh, you know, me as a project owner have to share my own projects uh, in, in, in social medias and do, do a stuff, but is that good for me? You know, how, how can help, uh, how can, how can give us uh, help me uh, during bringing donors to my project? I'm aware that uh, how, how can I uh, reach the donors? For example, uh, can I, as a project owner, can I explain to my donors that hey, there's a give backs there, you know. Um, that's it. Thank you. Then I think you were next. Thanks, Manik. Um, and actually, something that Mo, Monique, and, and me were talking uh, in the morning uh, was related to data um, of users. And I think it's not, I mean, definitely, I think we have, we should make more efforts to outreach and bring um, donors uh, into the platform, but also, and this is just a question I, I really don't know, um, but how are the people that have donated already behaving? Um, are we, do we have like a high churn rate or are 80% of the people that donated once, are they donating regularly? I think this is very important to know. Mm. Thanks, Nicola. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, echo what uh, Lauren said about, you know, I do notice because I'm, I'm uh, working on a verification of the project. I do, know, I do notice that there are some verified projects that are really also beautifully done and are lucky the support of the donors. So I have this idea and I'm just gonna shoot it in. Why don't we do something like a pick a project that will just once in a month or two weeks pick a verified project that we share on our Twitter and help them to promote, to get more donors interest. 
that's an idea that I wanted to share. Um, and I also think that the big part of onboarding projects and yeah, it's totally the education. And I witnessed that a lot of projects that are nonprofits, but they're eligible you know, to be verified are also very new to this environment. So the education part is really important and I can see how much uh, easier it is for people to grasp when they have it presented in a person form or a little more like engaged in let's say you know it's like a little workshop that we do together so that people can set up their own projects and wallets together and, and discuss the questions and little workshops like that and I'm wondering if there is a way how we could do something from the side to give it to create such a support team that would be able to you know do something like this and to provide more of the personal support as just an idea so that's, uh, that's I'm done here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. This this actually leads to uh, to maybe the last uh, red circle that we have. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes for that, but it's really relevant to to the connect group work also. Um, this idea of which mechanisms do we have that reactively or proactively push projects more to the top of a ranking or the website or the platform or even to Twitter, right? I mean, we have verification as we just discussed. There are some projects that cannot be verified. So that means if you match certain criteria, you're more visible on the platform. Uh, and we plan to, to replace that with give power on, on decentralized curation sort of mechanism. And I'm still wondering about the question that is on the screen sticker, what are best projects, right? So if our decentralized um, curation mechanisms work perfectly, which kinds of projects should be favored in that kind of curation? Which ones should be most visible? Should it just mirror the popularity of a project? Should there be an element of impact measurement expertise in it? You know, what, what is the right mix to sort of proactively favor or showcase specific projects on the platform? That again goes back to which criteria do we even have when we reach out to projects? How do we filter? And what are we most interested in? So I yes, wonder sir. what thoughts are around, uh, around that. I really think that this is something that we should like focus on improving on the DAP because right now um, we're sorting the projects like by some old quality score algorithm thing that we created that's like really kind of like not great and kind of favors projects that were added earlier, not mm -hmm. necessarily projects that include updates or get donations and na na na. So I think like um, once we have give power working, I, I do really like the idea of having um, give holders have a relative amount of control over like which projects are like the most featured um, because this is really an incentive for people to get give tokens. It's like people want to have give tokens because they want to help boost these projects and make these projects be noticed, make these projects get more matching, make their donors get more give backs, et cetera. So I think like give power should be part of it, but like what I'm working with the designers and things on give power is like uh, having like a ranking. So it's like give power affects a project's ranking, but we should include other things as well in the ranking system. And like, I think that this is something that we can like kind of hash through and would love like to get some more feedback from the connect group. Like there's the idea of like impact certificates or like somehow mm -hmm. measuring a project's impact. And this should affect their ranking as well. And perhaps the amount of money that they receive or the amount of the likes that they get, like amount of heart likes they get could somehow affect it. But I think we should hash through it a little bit more. But for starters, when we launch Give Power, like that should be like a big influencing factor. But yeah, considering also like the impact that project, projects are making and uh, like how active they are on the platform, like with updates and et cetera, um, can be considered. Um, yeah, but I, I do really like making give power like a big emphasis because I mean, like, I kind of like this comment. It's like, it's not on us as a platform to say whether it's better to help animals or refugees. So it's not on us as like the people who build giveth, but like the give token holders, like the people who are using giveth can vote on that. And that's really nice to kind of have that exit to community and like decentralization. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Ahmad and then Melody and then Simon. Yeah, so I was thinking, uh, what if it's like a um, Netflix, where it's like um, everybody gets their own featured projects depending on how they donated in the past. 
So that could also be something that we look into. Mm -hmm. Thanks, very interesting. Melody. Yeah, I just want to say from a general donor motivation point of view, um, just the past like experience or stats were telling us donor one, one motivation is that they want projects to have really big impact and almost like global impact. Uh, two, they want to donate to projects that near and dear to their heart, like those local grassroots that's in their location. So those are two things I think really needs to be considered. Whatever we do here, like either be verification or, um, you know, or the other. So if we have too many local um, like grassroots projects, then people, if they're only local to one place, then people on, in other places is gonna have nowhere to donate, then we need them to nominate projects. And then, however, there are, I do know there are a huge group of people who are really after uh, like most effective nonprofits or like they do these stats and they do these uh, impact analysis to themselves and then they decide to donate their money to the most impactful. Um, so those are the two kind of considerations in my opinion that needs to be weighed in there. Thanks. Simon. Um, I, I really like that insight of the impact um, uh, and I, I think that if we can somehow create an algorithm based on the amount of information that the donors are able to put into the platform, I don't know all the technicalities uh, of how they measure I only know a little bit about it, but if they're able to put in information and it automatically affects how they're featured on the platform, that'll be an incentive also for donors to put back information uh, into their profiles. Um, then also, uh, so we could then show to the donors who, which, um, which of the organizations are have the most have gotten the most donations maybe that's going to be a, a deterrent for some donors but maybe it also shows popularity who of those organizations have the highest impact and then uh, which of the organizations have are the most transparent it's not the right word but something to so that they can we can get their credibility and that trust uh, come uh -huh. across in that way they could just uh, feel a bit more strongly about donating to that um, organization. Yes, thank you. Just noted that down. Okay, we have 10 more minutes uh, and I want to respect the fact that uh, you all have maybe other commitments in 10 minutes and for some of you it's really late. We will need 10 more minutes to talk about next steps and wrap up. So um, I think this might be a good, good uh, moment just to have a break in this kind of discussion. You see, we could go into a thousand different directions with the input that you that you gave us on this uh, on this on this mirror board. Our job as the connect group is now to boil what we heard down into some sort of simple criteria set that helps us to, you know, really concentrate our efforts on the networks and the sort of communities of donors that I think uh, match best what we just described. So I think that's that's our homework on our end. Uh, but we would also love to know a little bit about, um, you know, if you wanted to have a kind of continuation of this discussion, in what form might that make sense? And I'll hand over to Claire for that next step so discussion. So I suppose that leads me to ask for feedback, whether you think these kinds of sessions are helpful. What particular aspects did you like? And if there's anything you'd change? I wonder if anybody's got any ideas or feedback they'd like to give on that. Did you find them useful? It's useful. Yeah, I found this to be useful. It's nice to like, I mean, it's nice. We've been kind of trying to do this a little in comms too, to zoom out and be like the bigger picture of like what our, what our targets are. Um, uh, one kind of like idea is that I would love, I mean, I made like some comments and in, in like post-it notes, but it's like, I would really love to like emphasize. And I think we need to do a better job with like onboarding new, new contributors is like getting really clear on like what the bigger long-term vision is for Giveth and set kind of sort of like the, like big picture zoomed out, like philosophies of um, like becoming not just a donation platform, but this whole idea of like 
creating like making nonprofits become DAOs with regenerative micro economies isn't just like so that it's both because then the public goods creation can become profitable, but also so that we can have like more honest systems of like feedback with the things that like we all are affected by like, like right now we're like that are being controlled by governments and corporations. It's like healthcare is like really profit driven, all these things. And I think like these, like I could rant, um, but it's like these kind of like bigger ideas that are like the central focus of a lot of the, the talks we do at give us, I think are like things that it would be great if we had like everyone on the team, like really aligned with. So then when we're doing this, like workshopping of like the smaller points along the path of like exactly how do we target the projects and how do we target the donors? It's like, we keep in, in mind, like where we're going in the long term and like the, the swiftest path to be building towards that end. Um, but I think it was really, really valuable. And I really, and, and really well organized. And I, I, I really appreciate like the mirror board and like the space to kind of hash through these things. And um, yeah, I think that there's more we can do with it. I also really, really like it. Um, for example, I, I, I started working for Giveth mostly on the builder side. And I'm, I'm really interested in dedicating most of my time right now there. But I, I do, for example, like my recent previous experience was a lot on growth and marketing. And that's why I, I really want to engage more with the connect group. And sometimes for some reason or another, I mean, Simone and I, Melody and I have talked a little bit, um, but we, sometimes it's hard to find the right spaces and times to, to work on these things. And it's good to work asynchronously, but sometimes it's just good to really kind of like uh, brainstorm and bounce some ideas together. And so for me, especially right now, that it's still kind of like taking some direction, the group, uh, I, I, I feel that it's very positive to have this exercise uh, from time to time, really cool. That's really great to hear, thank you. Any more comments? Yeah, I, I feel the same. Um, I feel that our weekly check-ins are very helpful to talk about our operational uh, tasks and check in on our progress, but these are really great to zoom out and just understand even just people's different opinions and perspectives on the direction um, and just general ideas. We've got very smart people in the room and it's great to be able to share ideas like this. Um, and as I said, the smart comment, I've forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> um, what is my other point? Uh, yeah, this format was also really helpful. Um, and the point's going to come back to me once I pass to the next person. Anybody else got anything they'd like to add? I also really enjoyed the way you manage and uh, that th th that's very professional. I appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, I just want to say that, uh, um, you know, uh, we always uh, talk about the priorities uh, for the roadmap of the platform and uh, the relation between uh, the philosophy that we uh, have the GIB token. So, we have a token, we have a token economics, and you know the philosophy is just to align incentives. Um, and because of that, we have an economy. Now, so, uh, you know, these discussions uh, helps us to uh, find it out and get, you know, uh, get the roadmap of the products even, you know, convinced by everybody. Uh, and uh, also, you know, uh, let us know what's what we're doing here and what, what we have to do in the future. Thank you. Maybe a comment from my side. So given the sort of number of comments and inputs that are now on this board, I'm really tempted to just have another round at some point and pick out other parts, right? Because you see there is this chain that overall should make sense. It does make sense, but there are sort of loopholes and fuzzy points, you know, and some things where it's not completely clear how it all fits together. And I think you could spend three or four rounds on, you know, fixing these connections and making really clear how things connect. Uh, and I'd love to do that at, at, at some point. And, and again, no, it's not an academic exercise. It, I think it's really helpful. And um, the way I've, 
I've experienced give it. It's a very improvisational group. And I think that's where the beauty is, right? To have this right balance of improvisation and serendipity and, and co-creation and structure on the other side. And maybe this can help to, you know, balance this in the most organic way possible. So maybe there's a way to do this every, I don't know, couple of weeks or so uh, with different, you know, focal points um, to, to do the zooming out uh, exercise at some point. Yeah, I agree. I think it was very great exercise, not only, you know, to really zoom out, but also bump heads together. And I think it's very important to get to a point where we're on the same page, all of us. I can totally see value in having uh, this uh, exercise practice more often, even for like new contributors, so that we can get really all unified. And at the same time, still looking for the ways how we can break the old patterns, right? the old patterns of the old systems. How can we really innovate? So I really appreciate this time with you all of you. Thank you so much for beautiful presentation. Such a fun tool as a mirror is. Yeah, thank you. Just from my point, I just want to point out that we have a hypothesis where we derived from our perception of Giveth, as well as the documentation and what's out there already about Giveth. But then we see all these stickies at the bottom, which people disagree with this hypothesis. So, which means that we really need to do more work on this. So we, what we're gonna actually do is take it back and analyze this data and kind of synthesize this a little bit and see what where the disagreements are, where are the fuzzy things that Rainer has been talking about, and then create like probably more sessions, successive sessions, so that we can be all clear. Um, yeah, so that's that's the uh, the feeling. But now we have at time. Um, I think we we should just uh, leave it like that. Uh, if anybody else wants to comment, please do, and or we'll just. Um, See you next time, I guess. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank and you. especially thank you so much. the ones among you that are very early in the day or yeah. very late at night. Late. So yeah. Thanks so much. Very much appreciated. Thank Great. you. Appreciate thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Uh, stay tuned. Bye, yeah. Bye bye. Come back. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye.